Welcome to the Animation Podcast, an official podcast of Filmbook. The Animation Podcast is a weekly animation news podcast that reports on the latest animation movie and TV show news. Oh, I'm shaking in my boots. <laughs> I'm shaking in my boots. And it's not just because of the epic trailer voice today. It is because uh, hopefully today is Halloween. If, it, if it's not Halloween, if we if I'm late getting this to you guys, um, just know just know that it, uh, it's a very spooky, scary November 1st, perhaps. Or, or even later, I don't know. I'd say uh, I would put in a, um, a spooky sound effect. For something here, uh, I tell our editors to do that, but I'm also the editor, and I don't have the time to do that, so <laughs> this is what we get. Um, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Animation Podcast, a weekly podcast about all things animation brought to you by Filmbook. My name is Ephraim Burney. If you're tuning into the Animation Podcast for the first time, what I do on this podcast is discuss the current week's animation news. Find more The Animation Podcast episodes on Filmbook, that's film-book.com, by using the search term The Animation Podcast. If you're listening to this podcast on iTunes or another podcasting service, please rate and review this episode. If you are listening to this on uh, YouTube or anything like that, please like our video, subscribe, and consider becoming one of our patrons on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash filmbook. Your support helps us bring you even more engaging content. You guys let me know if you want me to not say the same information that the the little trip, the trailer epic man says at the beginning of each thing at each time. Um, Because I'm literally just repeating it, I've realized. But this is the script and I need to get this stuff to you anyway. But you let me know and I'll figure it out. Um, Okay, Uh, everybody knows what I'm going to talk about this week. Um, There's a lot of great other things going on, but the world of animation was practically uh, meteorite hit the stage this week with the trailer, the release of the trailer for Pixar's newest movie, Lightyear. The spin-off movie centering around the actual guy um, that the toy is based off of, Buzz Lightyear. Um, as a fan of the older Buzz Lightyear Star Command TV series, and obviously the Toy Story movies, I'm excited, but I think like many of you, um, I imagine, I am cautiously waiting for what the final product is going to be here. Now, I'm not going to lie. The animation for this movie, at least from the trailer, looks like it's going to be the best we've ever gotten. And I'm not talking just Pixar here. I think this is setting a new bar for what all of CGI animation is going to look like. The the detail, the lighting, the way that the little particles and the doodads shake and Buzz's rocket ship as he blasts off into space. It looks so unbelievably vivid and grounded in reality. I mean, it feels... There are moments in it where I forgot that it wasn't live action or something like that. And then you'd see his, you know, you see him wearing the suit or his kind of freakish square, (laughs) square face, his Mr. Incredible face. Um, And then you go back to reality of it not being reality. Um, But I got it. I'll admit, I probably like most of you, I will admit um, when they were playing David Bowie and you see the sun, (laughs) hit the reflection on Buzz's helmet as he's, you know, speeding off in his spaceship or him looking out the window. It looks like Mars or something. He's looking at a space colony. I felt myself give in to that sort of wide-eyed whimsy that Pixar practically bottles up and sells. It felt like, oh my god, this is... This is them. This is what I have... I haven't felt like this since I was a kid. That's that that new movie feel that I can't wait to see it. Like, they're so good at that feeling. And I let myself give into it a little bit. And I know already there's probably a little bit of controversy around they don't have Tim Allen voicing Buzz. Um, I think it makes sense because it's supposedly it's not the toy talking it's like the real guy so i get that he would probably sound a little different and i think you know i like chris evans a lot i think chris evans seems like the perfect guy for this kind of sort of a you know that captain america all american chutzpah sort of thing that he does um so there's clearly a lot to be excited about 
The question that we all have to ask ourselves is where is this film coming from and how much is it willing to risk to prove itself? Pixar for a while, and in many ways it still does have this, but uh, for a while it had pretty much a free pass to make whatever the hell it wanted. <laughs> it's track record and its name brand power alone would attract a large enough audience to make its movies a hit. It just was it was the thing to see if you were a kid. Um, and that all sort of came into question. I mean, so many more CGI animated movies come out this year, you know, these days and uh, uh, Illumination gives it uh, gives it a run for its money and Disney has, you know, its actual films that it pushes that also compete. Um, but for a while, it's just, its track record was, was untouchable until around the time when, uh, Good Dinosaur came out. And ever since then, it's sort of been an interesting mix of movies that have varying degrees of quality. Financially, they are all hits. Let's be honest. They are all do, they all do very, very well. (laughs) Um, and critically too. I think most people seem to really like these movies. Maybe it's just me. I don't like them as much as I used to. Um, Regardless, um, to have a Buzz Lightyear movie, a story from w- about one of the most instantly recognizable characters from arguably the company's biggest franchise, uh, you could probably hear the cops coming after me right now, <laughs> me talking about this, but it is a double-sided sword. On the good side of the sword, I, I guess this idiom kind of falls apart once you actually start trying to say a good side and a bad side of a sword. Regardless, on the, the good side of the sword, um, people will see Lightyear. I have no doubt that it will probably be the most lucrative movie of, the, at least the most lucrative animated movie of 2022. Um, but they will also go into it with a slew of expectations. Many people were already pretty divided about the fourth Toy Story movie. It's debatable if that one met the bar set by its predecessors. I liked that movie, but I acknowledge it has many mixed views, and I'll admit I thought the third one was overall more satisfying. That being said, if Lightyear takes a more darker, grounded, and serious tone, like its trailer kind of seems to suggest it might... I think this one could be really something new and exciting and, innov- you know, innovative, all those all those adjectives, um, but monumental, I should say, for the series, but also for Pixar itself. It's directed by Pixar veteran director Angus McLean, who co-directed Finding Dory. Now, I don't know if that's a great sign. I'm not saying it's a bad sign, but I don't know if it's, like... It's not the it's not getting me super hyped or whatever like the trailer actually does. Um, I didn't I wasn't crazy about Finding Dory. I know some people really liked it. I think it did financially pretty well. Um, I just felt like it it simultaneously like only existed because of its source material, but also didn't have much respect for its source material. Um, that's its own. That's my own separate rant. We don't need to go into that. That being said, everybody is talking about. Lightyear. It's got all, it's already being memed and shared all over the place. I think we are all very interested and we all will be watching um, come summer 2022. Now, in other big news, maybe not as exciting from the get go, but certainly very interesting, um, Genius, Bo- uh, Genius Brands International has acquired Wow Unlimited Media for approximately $53 million in cash and stock. Genius Brands, uh, you may know as the folks behind platforms like Cartoon Channel and Cartoon Classroom. Both cartoons are spelt with a K. <laughs> uh, they also uh, have been the originators behind shows like Stanley's Superhero K- Kindergarten, Rainbow Rangers, Llama Llama, or their hit Netflix uh, series Baby Genius. Uh, the company's manifesto is that of making content with a purpose, um, which seems to imply that they are most interested in making content for children that appears to skew towards an educational nature. This uh, would be just another merger, except for the fact that WoW Unlimited Media is the parent company of Frederator Entertainment. And I know all of us, all of a sudden, everybody got a little more, <laughs> their ears perked up a little bit. So WoW and Frederator, if you don't know these big names, are the production companies behind shows like Fairly Odd Parents, uh, Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, and uh, what I'm kind of keeping an eye on, Adventure Time. 
It's currently unclear what Genius Brands intends to do with these properties in particular, or if they will even have much to say in what happens to them. Genius spoke only on their excitement of the merger and that they intend to use Frederator's Canadian animation studios to expedite their animation timelines and manufacturing, as well as taking advantage of Canadian tax cuts and incentives. As the world of Adventure Time kind of expands already, I mean, it's already got two new shows on HBO Max, uh, the Distant Land series, and last year, that, that was last year, and uh, they just got greenlit for Fiona and Cake. Uh, um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this new management might affect that show. So let's move on to news. Uh, that's my big news. Let's move on to news in uh, streaming and other kind of net networks that might be, uh, you know, you might want to keep an eye on. Over on Fox, we got news that the madman himself, Mr. John Hamm, will be starring and serving as executive producer on the network's newest adult animated comedy, Grimsburg. Ham will play Marvin Flute, a cynical detective attempting to rekindle a relationship with his ex-wife and estranged son. The logline doesn't give us much more than that to go on, but from the concept art, we can see that the town of Grimsburg will have some kind of fantasy elements to it. It looks a it looks kind of inspired by something like Fargo or True Detective, and the supporting cast seems to consist of like yeah, other kind of fantasy characters. Like, there's a cyborg. Looks like there's a talking skeleton. So it'll be, you know, maybe a darker, magical side to it, perhaps. Um, the show comes from the brains of Catelyn McClellan and uh, Matthew Schizzle. I hope I'm saying that right. Schizzle? Schlizzle? Maybe. Matthew Schlizzle, perhaps. Um, both are relative question marks in what their writing style is going to be like. Uh, they seem to be newcomers in the world of cartoons. So we can only wait and see. But Bento Box will be animating, so if that's, uh, if that's something that you go for, if you liked Bob's Burgers or, or Central Park, come on through to, um, to Fox here. It doesn't, it's not going to look like Bob's Burgers, but it will be from the same animation company. On Paramount Plus, we got the premiere of Star Trek Prodigy, the newest entry into the Trekkie universe from the brains of the Emmy Award winning Hageman Boys. Again, Hageman Boys, I hope that's <laughs> hope that's how you say your name. Uh, you know them from things like Ninjago and Troll Hunters. They've teamed up with director Ben Hibben in the hopes of creating the franchise's first installment aimed specifically for younger folks. Star Trek has always been kind of a tricky beast to adapt, certainly in recent times where the Hollywood reboot machine is very eager to make it into an action-adventure story, or more of a satire of itself, like we see in Lower Docks. From the trailers for Prodigy, it does look like it kind of has, it doubles down on that action-adventure angle, but we just have to watch the show and find out for ourselves. Um, I've always thought that the Star Trek, a Star Trek for kids and tweens and whatnot could, you know, might actually not be a bad idea if they found a way to make the philosophical and ethical deliberating that the show is so famous for just a little bit more accessible. But we'll see. It came out this week. Everybody ought to check it out. And look, while we're on, while we're scrolling through Paramount+, Plus, I should tell you that the streaming platform has given us a release date for the new South Park special, South Park Post-COVID. You and your family, or maybe not your whole family, uh, can celebrate Cartman and Stan and Kyle. I, th I think... Kenny probably died at some point, um, <laughs> again, um, but you can celebrate their continued health together as the special releases on Thanksgiving Day, November 25th. And lastly, from the world of networking and, and networks and streaming and stream working, <laughs> uh, Netflix premiered Inside Job earlier this week, the paranoid homage to conspiracy theories from creator and showrunner Shion Takauchi and executive producer Alex Hirsch, uh, creator of Gravity Falls. I'm not going to talk too much about this one right now. I'll go into it further later on in this episode, but as, uh, as of the end of the week, um, it seems to be relatively well-received. Let's move on to some anime news, huh? Let's do it, gang. In the world of anime news, Funimation released its fall series lineup with the uh, this past Thursday, slating over 25 new and returning series. The industry titan will be giving us a host of exciting new shows, some of them exclusive to Funima Funimation, as well as more Demon Slayer content, among other things. 
I'm going to read through a couple of highlights that I saw that I thought were particularly interesting that we might want to keep an eye on. I'll give you their log lines so you know what they're about and their release dates. But it seems like most of these have actually already come out. So you might already be ahead of the game with this one. Uh, but this is what they're, this is what Funimation is excited for. Some new shows include um, The Selection Project, which is about Suzuni Miyama, who has been sick since childhood, but has always used the idol Akari Amasawa's music for encourage, uh, for courage through hard times. Now in her final year of junior high, Suzuni uh, is auditioning against thousands of contestants to become one of the nine chosen idols in The Selection Project. Uh, can she follow in her icon's footsteps? We shall see. It come. It came out October 1st this year. Next, we have Irina, the Vampire Cosmonaut. Just from the name alone, I was kind of excited. It is a Funimation, Funimation exclusive. Now, it's about two, how uh, Space Race has spawned a secret project between two space superpowers. Um, superpowers as in, like continents, countries, not, like, getting superpowers. A human overseer and a vampire subject must achieve an experimental mission to the stars together. Um, the simulcast began on October 3rd. Again, you might already be watching. Next, we have Ama Im, Warrior at the Borderline. Uh, after world tyrants conquer Japan, a young freedom fighter and his mech ignite the flames of rebellion within its oppressed people. It began on October 4th. And then we have Banished from the Heroes Party, I Decided to Live a Quiet Life in the Countryside. Yes, that is its entire name. <laughs> Um, it's about a, uh, um, a character called Red, after being betrayed by his hero's party, um, the Red hopes to, uh, start anew by opening an apothecary in a small town, and he hopes to keep his past life a secret, but it won't be easy, especially when a beautiful adventurer from his past asks to move in. Um, the simulcast began on October 6th. And in content that you might already be familiar with, Funimation is re uh, releasing two new dragon demons, not dr dra dragon, that's a like video game, uh, Demon Slayers, um, that's Demon Slayer Kimitsu no Yaiba Mugen Train arc, uh, this is uh, the seven episode arc that adapts the popular film with a never before seen original episode of Kyojiro Rengoku is taking on a new mission on the way of the on the way to the Mugen train. And they have a uh, Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yab, uh, Yaiba and uh, Entertainment District Arc. <laughs> no, I'm saying it like I'm reading it aloud. It is because I am reading it off of a thing right now. Um, but it's the Kimetsu no Yaiba Enter Entertainment District arc. Uh, immediately following the Mugen train arc, the Demon Slayer uh, introduces a new major demon Daki who the young adventurers must contend with, and that they will go back to back. Um, the first simulcast began for the first one was October 10th, and then once that concludes, uh, we go into the next one on December 5th. Um, besides that, there is Yasha Himi, Princess Half Demon, the second act, which uh, picks up from the first act, which was long lost twins Toa and Setsuna reunite after 10 years to discover that they are the half demon daughters of the great demon. Seso Homaru. Look at that. I did that. <laughs> I did all that from one one take. Uh, that began on October 12th. Uh, October 2nd. I'm sorry. October 2nd. Wow. I'm very proud of myself doing that in one take. Okay. Done with anime. Let's move on to the world of animation around the world in foreign places that you might not initially hear from. Now, um, I'm very excited to tell you, because I predicted it last week, um, I was saying that Flea, everyone's favorite Dutch, French, Norwegian, Swedish documentary, was on its way to the big leagues, and this week they proved me right. Not only did the film win big at the Animation is Film Film Festival, which we at uh, the Animation Podcast are actually partnering with this next week, and several other weeks to review some of the films. Um, but, moving backwards, but as the film, as, as of this week... Flea has been officially selected as Denmark's submission to the Academy Awards. A reminder, the movie has at least three categories that it can win big in. Um, best Foreign Film, Best Documentary, and Best Animated Movie. And I would be surprised if it, uh, I would be surprised at this point if we don't see it in at least one of those. Maybe two. 
Um, my sincerest congratulations to the entire team being uh, bringing the bringing the movie um, to life and whatnot. I am sending you guys the best of luck when it comes to more awards and nominations. Uh, congratulations, gang! In other exciting news, HBO Max has greenlit its first ever European adult animated series, Pobre Diablo, or in English, Poor Devil. Um, the series will have eight episodes, each ranging around 20 minutes long, and is written and created by Joaquin Reyes, Miguel Esteban, and Ernesto Sevilla. Um, and, uh, Helena Pozuelo, uh, is co-writing, or at least slated to co-write. Esteban, uh, who you may know is the co-creator, uh, as a co-creator on shows like, uh, The End of Comedy on Comedy Central and, uh, Netflix's The Neighbor, he is also slated to direct, which is exciting for him and anybody who is a fan of those two shows. The show is about an 18-year-old named Stan, who is the son of Satan. Satan has big plans for Stan to eventually take over the family business of running hell, but Stan has dreams of becoming a Broadway performer instead. <laughs> Uh, the animation itself will be coming from the Spanish company Rokin uh, Animation Studios over in Granada. And the show is slated to launch at some point next year. So if you like that sort of, you know, wacky family thing, it's not it's nothing that we haven't seen before. But kind of like, um, I don't know, it almost reminds me of like Arthur Christmas, but in reverse. Um, <laughs> I think it is funny that he wants to be a Broadway uh, performer. That's That's pretty funny. Um, okay, um, we don't have much, we don't have much news in the world of home video and digital HD releases, but I've got one little tidbit for you. In news from China, I guess this also combines with, um, with, uh, news from overseas, um, in news from China, their fantasy anime-esque adventure film Monkey King Reborn has set a digital and home release date. So if you want to give the uh, give the reimagined look at one of China's oldest and most enduring stories, uh, you can grab yourself a copy on December 7th, just in time for Christmas. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about reviews. Now, normally this week I was planning on reviewing Inside Job which I'm going to talk about again more later on, again, more later on. But we've actually partnered up with the Animationist Film Film Festival, um, so I'm actually going to be talking about, for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be reviewing one of the movies that premiered there this last week. Um, and we'll pro that'll probably last maybe four or five episodes of this. And I'll also, I might forego, um, I might forego a recommendation each week to talk about something else that came out this week, just so I stay current with what's going on. So, the first film that we're going to talk about this week is uh, Le Fortune Favors Lady Nikuko. Um, it's directed by Ayumu Watanabe. Uh, the screenplay is by Satomi Oshima. And um, the production company is Studio 4 Degrees Celsius. They're actually involved with a couple of films, I think, in this film festival. I, I, I have to check my notes later on, but I'm pretty sure they are. The cast includes uh, Kokomi as the main character, Kikuko, uh, Shinobu uh, Otake uh, as Nikuko, that's the mother, they have identical names, that comes in, that's a plot point later on, um, and Natsuki Hane is uh, um, Ninomiya, Ninomiya, again, names, guys, uh, <laughs> I'm not good at them, I'm so sorry, I should be better, but I'm not, um, okay, so let me give you, let me tell you a little bit about this movie. There are a lot of ways that you can categorize Fortune Favors Lady Nikuko. Um, at its most fundamental level, the film is an anime uh, coming-of-age story about Kiku, um, a girl who's just on the brink of her teens, feeling out of place while living with her mom, Nikuko, in a small port town. Her mother is very round, is a very round, pudgy lady who is overflowing with energy and often misplaced charisma. Kiku spends the majority of the movie navigating life in this small town while trying to survive the embarrassment she has towards her mom. But more than all that, I would say that Nikuko uh, is a movie that tells its story through contrasts. And I think the film is at its most successful when it walks that sort of fine line. And I, I can explain. I can explain all this. <laughs> I know you're kind of like, what the hell is he talking about? From practically the very beginning of the movie, Kiku is paralleled against her mom. The writers make a point fairly early on to tell us that the two women share nearly identical names, Nikuko and Kikuko. Kiku for short. Uh, despite that, Kiku and practically all the other townsfolk are relentless in telling us that the mother and daughter couldn't be more different. 
From the animation perspective, the character designs and movement tell us this story. Uh, Nikuko is large and, on and only gets larger throughout the movie. She's drawn very simply. Uh, her silhouette is practically all circles and ovals. Her eyes and mouth are usually little more than two lines and a big goofy, goofy grin. Uh, she's round and has very quick, expressive movements, making her seem more feminine than one might initially give her credit for. I know it kind of feels cringy for me to be tight. I'm, I wrote that all out but and saying that, but the, the script of the film wants us to note that. They have characters saying that she is feminine despite her big size. Um... Opposing all, opposing her mom is Kiku, and Kiku is practically all straight lines, right? She calls herself scrawny several times in the script, and her design is very lanky and narrow. Her face is also drawn to be a foil against her mom. Kiku's eyes and facial expressions are very detailed. In fact, one of the things I noted while I was watching the movie is the level of detail of the lines on some of the very close-ups of Kiku, going so far as to have what looks like like actual pencil strokes and chicken scratch on her eyebrows and inside of her irises. Um, the close-up portrait shots like this are usually there to heighten one of Kiku's more moments of stillness and to emphasize her introversion, another contrast with her mom. Lastly, and again, it feels weird to point this out, but uh, uh, going against Nikuko's feminine energy, Kiku is very androgynous, and there are several major plot points, or like semi-major plot points, in that she has yet to start having her period. So you have these two characters that are, the, the story is about how these two kind of opposites that are tied together have to interact, right? I won't go too further in too much further into the actual story, mostly because it's much more of an episodic film. Uh, there are chapters when uh, Kiku deals with her girl pals at school, or how to pick uh, how to pick between friends, and then later on she has to talk to a boy that she has an interest in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know these these kind of plot points. They're chapters in this film, um, but the chapters don't necessarily build on each other. Um, I appreciated that in a sense, as it felt more true to life as a young adult, but also you might be wanting something that kind of builds over time. The movie, like, the movie likes to take its time with things. That's a good way of saying it. But I never felt bored while watching it. It's almost like reading a very relaxing diary of someone who's just trying to figure things out. Um, but there's no real urgency or stakes in doing so. It's a very meditative film, mostly because it's a reflection of its protagonist. This is the case uh, for practically the whole movie, but the last quarter of the film makes kind of a pivot. Uh, there isn't really a twist per se, but there is a realization that Kiku makes by the very end that while structurally it was foreshadowed really, really well, felt sort of like the least interesting choice that the writers could have made for these characters. That's all I'm going to say. Um, it kind of, I thought it... It wasn't a great ending, but I, I still, I get why they did it, and I thought it was still a really, you know, a really poignant movie. Um, I'm going to make two last points. Um, there are a bunch of characters, a bunch of other characters for me, but uh, for me, the standout has to be the boy uh, that Kiku befriends towards the middle of the film. Um, I said him earlier, but Nino Mia. Uh, initially introduced as sort of a standoffish, cool kid with emo hair covering his face, it's later revealed that he might have some some form of, like, um, that he's just embarrassed, he's, like, just as embarrassed and introverted as Kiku. And while it's not outright spoken in the script, it's pretty heavily implied that he has some form of, like, Tourette's or Tourette's syndrome or some other disorder that causes him to break out into goofy faces, which I think is some, like, genius symbiosis with character design and writing. Like, of course, if he's ashamed of the faces that he makes, he would grow his hair out and try to cover himself up. And it's also, it's, an inter it's interesting to note that he is one of the only other characters in the movie to make, like, super exaggerated faces, like Nikuko, the mom. But Kiku adores him for making those faces while she's embarrassed, totally embarrassed by her mom. I just thought that was really an interesting contrast there. Oh, and lastly, this is an observation I'm sure everyone who is going to watch the movie will make. Uh, but food plays a huge role in this movie, um, since Nikuko is practically always eating. And the food is really just 
really just spectacular to look at. I know it's kind of a trope in anime that the meals always look like absolutely delicious but like damn like i had to pause this movie and make dinner for myself and watch the whole thing while i watched the thing and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon that's how like it's <laughs> it spurred a hunger within me uh it's a really relaxing and charming movie that i feel like it sort of falls apart at the end but still has a great emotional payoff and makes for a fun watch i'd give it a three and a half maybe a three and three three and three quarters out of five that'll be my review of that now, I don't really have a recommendation this week. I I was watching too many... I was watching two things. I had to watch all these films at the same time, so I didn't have time to watch something that I really want to recommend to you guys. But I will talk... I promised you guys I would talk about Inside Job, and I, I think I'll spend a little bit of time here talking about that. Um, Inside Job, I don't even have anything written for this. I went into Inside Job really kind of excited for... Um, excited for by the premise it seemed like something i like totally tar i love kind of the darker like uh, conspiracy comedy stuff and i i really liked the idea of a shadow government show i thought that was really interesting and fun um and i love i was really excited by the idea of alex hirsch um just because i loved gravity falls so much ever you've watched I think I've brought him up, like, <laughs> this is my fourth episode. I think I've brought him up every single time. <laughs> um, but I did. I loved Gravity Falls so much. Um, and so I was excited to see what Alex Hirsch might do in a more adult setting. I have watched, I haven't watched the whole show yet, but I've watched, I think, five episodes at this point. And while there have been moments that have made me laugh, I think the show kind of struggles with, you know, really landing, really landing with it. I think, and I think it kind of comes from the characters. Again, I wish I had, I, I wish I had written something down and really had the time to kind of meditate on this one. Maybe I'll come back next week after having finished the whole thing. Um, but I think the characters are sort of stuck in themselves in that they don't really escape the archetypes that they are based off of. The one, the two kind of uh, exceptions to this rule are the main characters, Reagan and um, Brett, are the two, I think they're two names. Um, they feel like they get sort of characterized at, cer at certain points. Uh, Brett, in particular, is like a really fun character in that he's just like a, uh, he's just like a Labrador retriever a little bit. Not a very smart guy, but wants the best for everybody. And that kind of gets put, put to the test in certain aspects when he finds out that he, he can't make everybody like him. And Reagan too, um finds out that she can't do everything that she wants to do, but these feel like stories that are just, like, the outlines of ideas a little bit. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's a great big supporting cast of characters that are really cool, and the designs are really fun. Um, there's, a like, a, telep a telepathic mushroom, and there's, like, this dolphin guy who's a hybrid with a human but they don't feel like anything other than what they are like these these small confining archetypes like um there's the the scientist guy and he's just he's just a drug addict and that's kind of just it he's just like he just pops pills all the time and he's always looking for a high then there's the social media girl and she's just that she's just kind of vapid and doesn't have much they don't put her to the test. The mushroom guy is horny for what <laughs> they just like that's his thing. And the and the general the the dolphin guy is just a general. Like he doesn't I don't know all of their jokes felt like it was either playing off of these very basic concepts or it was pop culture references. And I think that is the fastest way to make a show feel dated in a couple of years. You can do this stuff like that with long-running shows like Family Guy or The Simpsons or, or South Park because that's what they're about. But show one-off shows like this are going to feel really kind of lame in a couple of years. I'm, I worry because they are totally confined to what they are in that moment.
That being said, in like typical Hirsch fashion, there's a lot of fun Easter eggs in the background. I also need to give credit to Takeuchi. Uh, Alex Hirsch is not the is not the creator or the showrunner. He's just the executive producer, and uh, Takeuchi really does a great job with creating this world that is admittedly kind of exciting and addicting to keep coming back to, to see the shadow government. I think that's the strongest part of it. The world itself is much more developed than I think the characters are, which is sort of the downfall, I think, of the whole thing. There's some great little Easter eggs in the background. They, you know, they go to the bar, and the bar is called, M, you know, McUltras, which is like MK Ultra. And then they play a pinball on uh, a machine that's like Polybius. So, you know, they have all these really great, um, they have these great sort of conspiracy theory references, which are really, really fun. Um, and I just wish that we had characters that were as excited and as fun to explore in this world. Um, and that's, maybe that's it. Maybe that's, that, maybe that's all I want to say about it right now. I'm going to give, I'm going to finish watching it. I feel like I ought to give it a, an honest chance. And there are moments in it that make me laugh really hard. There's a great joke, um, there, I won't spoil an episode for you, but there's a great joke where, um, they're on trial and the dolphin warmonger type character says he pleads the fifth and then he screams and the second <laughs> and he pulls out a shotgun <laughs> i think that that you know that made me laugh um but i know like i feel like the laughs are kind of few and far between i know i just spoiled one of the good laughs for you but uh <laughs> that's that for me um, that's, that's all I want to say about it right now. And I'll, I'll probably continue this later next week when I finish the whole thing. But anyway, I'm going to wrap up the episode right now with that. Thank you for watching and listening to, <laughs> listening, sorry. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Animation Podcast. Be sure to like this episode and subscribe. You can find more of my work on Filmbook, that's film-book.com. Just search for Ephraim Bernie or the Animation Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at Frumbler or on Instagram at Ephraim underscore burning. If you would like to contact us, you can email us at podcast at filmbook.com with the uh, animation podcast as the subject line. Tune in next time or uh, next week for, for the latest episode of the animation podcast and all things animation. Thank you for listening and I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the animation podcast. Find more of the Animation Podcast on Filmbook, on your favorite podcast service, and on YouTube.